In our nation, in our generation, we worship our wants. I will do what I want, when I want, with who I want, for as long as we want, no matter what you want. And you can hear that in our love songs and in their lyrics. Listen to what we've heard. You don't own me, and I'm not just one of your many toys. You don't own me. Don't say I can't go with other boys. Don't tie me down because I never stay. I'm free and I love to be free. I can do what I want. I can experience what I want. What I want is good. And so long as I don't hurt anybody else, you can't tell me what to do with my life. And that has a direct impact on our view of sex, of sexual expression, our sexual identity, of dating, of romance, of marriage, and intimacy. As a result, in America and in our generation, we have basically one of three approaches to sex. The first is that we see sex as gross. Maybe because you were hurt or abused, sexually abused, sexually exploited, manipulated, Maybe you were exposed to painful sexual experiences at a young age or as an adult you were raped or taken advantage of or you had another painful experience as a result for you, sex is directly connected with very hurtful, painful things and so it's gross. Or maybe you grew up in a religious experience where um, you, know, you were told that God hates sex or we don't talk about sex. And so for you, you just kind of grew up thinking and feeling like sex is bad. God thinks it's bad and so sex is gross. Another approach would be that sex is a gift given by God for our enjoyment. And that one's a rare approach to, view, to the view of sexuality. And the third, which is the most prevalent, in fact, I would say it's the vast, vast majority of our nation and our generation, uh, views sex as God. And so we worship our sexual wants as God, and we sacrifice our life and our livelihood at the altar of sex. We see anyone and everyone as primarily a sexual being, and we know that sex Cells. And, and so you go, you know, what does it look like when you get caught and trapped in a lifestyle where you see sex as God? And, and, and so the thought is this, that sex is the sweetest song you can sing. It fills the love songs. And so I want to tell you a, an ancient story taken from Homer's The Odyssey about Captain Ulysses and the Song of the Siren Mermaids. So let me give you the background and then I'll just um, share a little bit of the story with you. Here it is. So the ships would sail by the islands where the siren mermaids sat on the rocks, luring the captains and their sailors toward the rocks where they would become shipwrecked and perish. It's kind of a cruel trick the sirens singing this sensual song and then the ship sailing toward them only to be destroyed and devastated. And so Ulysses is sailing his ship and preparing to approach these islands and his shipmates are terrified. And so he has a plan. His plan is this, that every one of the sailors would put beeswax in their ears, all of them except him. He wants to enjoy the song, but he doesn't want to destroy his ship. And so he has, he has his shipmates tie him to the mast of the ship. Then they are forbidden to look at him so that they can't hear or see him appealing and begging to be freed. And so they, the ship sails, as Homer writes, and approaches the siren mermaids. They're singing, and as it goes, that the story goes that Ulysses begins to scream at his men and shout. Then he goes from screaming to threatening, telling them that he's going to make them walk the plank or he's going to throw them to the cyclopses, and then he's reduced to begging. The story says that he just, he just falls, and he's 
pleading that somebody set me free so that I can respond to the song and pursue the siren mermaids. Eventually, the ship sails past the, the islands and the rocks and the, the crew, of course, were oblivious to Ulysses' screams and shouts. They couldn't hear his, his um, begging, even though it, his screams grew louder as the song grew lovelier. And, and the, as the ship passed by, by the siren rocky coastline, they finally went beyond the reach of the songs, and the story concludes this way. An exhausted Ulysses, his face a deep scarlet from the struggle, finally was untied and fell limp upon the ship's deck. Why, he moaned with his remaining strength, why does it seem that the things I desire most in this life lead to my destruction. Why must I be restrained from something so beautiful? The mast is my savior this day from the headlong craving for that sweet but deadly song of the siren mermaids. And maybe you're in a similar spot where you, you've either just put the beeswax in your ears and you refuse to listen to the song at all, or maybe you've tied yourself to the mast of self-restraint and you find yourself weary and exhausted, most people within a religious context or within a moral context struggle wondering about this forbidden song and why God's restrictions would keep them from enjoying the sensual pleasure of the siren mermaids. But I want to challenge you that there's a, a different way of viewing our sexuality, and that is that God is not putting unreasonable restrictions forbidding us from enjoying the song. It's that God is actually given a sweeter song, and he has provided instruction on how best to enjoy our sexuality. I want you to think about your sexuality as a powerful resource, a little bit like maybe you have children training them to enjoy driving a vehicle. It's powerful, and when rightly used, it can be very purposeful and even enjoyable. But if you abuse driving, it can lead to your ruin and your destruction. And so God provides a life manual on how to live. And within the manual of the Bible, what we call the word of God, is specific instruction from God about dating and marriage, about romance and even sexual intimacy. There is a specific book called the Song of Songs written by King Solomon. And it's called Songs because it's the greatest love song ever written. Eight chapters inspired by God's spirit included in the Bible to provide not just a story, but a God story of love to instruct us on how to best live and enjoy our sexuality. The story and the song is specifically uh, the story of King Solomon falling in love with this young woman, this peasant uh, who he sees and falls in love with. And it tells the story of their attraction, their affection, their courtship, their marriage, and it, the song is specifically and full of their sexual encounter. And so let me read a little bit to you. You might even wonder as I read, what does a song written, you know, in 1000 BC have to do with my life today? And I think you might find very quickly that it's powerfully relevant to us today. It goes like this. How beautiful you are, my darling. How beautiful your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your two breasts are like two fawns, like twin fawns of a gazelle that browse among the lilies until the day breaks and the shadows flee and I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. All beautiful you are, my darling. There is no flaw in you. And as I'm reading that, I'm thinking you probably are uh, are shocked that I would read something like that in an environment like this. You might even be a little caught off guard. And let me also say that there's a lot of metaphor in here, uh, meaning there's some double entendre. You can read between the lines to understand what he's saying about enjoying his new bride in their bed. And I want to challenge you that 
God has something to say about what happens in your bedroom, what happens in the privacy and the intimacy of your loving relationship. And so I want to I give you a, a key principle that jumps off the pages of this song. And, and so let me, let me read one more portion to you, and then let me give you that key principle. It's this. He continues singing, you are a garden fountain, a well of flowing water streaming down from Lebanon. And then she replies, awaken north wind and come south wind. Blow on my garden that its fragrance may spread abroad. Let my lover come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. And what's the point? The principle that God offers regarding the instruction of our sexuality is this, that while the world around you, the culture is singing, telling you that the sweetest song is one of just, you know, giving yourself to every want and every desire sexually, the principle is purity is the sweeter song of sex. You and I, we find ourselves desperately wanting like Ulysses, or shipwrecked like most of the other captains that went before him, wrecking our lives. And many of you, you have that experience right now. In fact, as I'm speaking, you're, you're just feeling the guilt and the shame because you've went down a road that your life has led toward shipwreck. But every one of us are driven by desires that shipwreck our hearts and lives. In fact, it's a, it's a national epidemic let me just share with you a little bit of how bad it is that we shipwreck our lives. Do you know that the, uh, the average person's first sexual experience, meaning they have sex at the age of 16 years old. And when, when, we, when people are having sex at a younger age, uh, studies prove that there is a significantly increased rate of alcohol use, drug use, um, eating disorders, and the suicide rate among our teenagers. Meaning, uh, when, we, when we are worshiping at the God of sex, it's destroying our generation. Porn is a $16 billion global industry, and that's a $12 billion industry right here in the United States of America. I, I get it. You and I, we don't have any grasp of what that means, so let me put it in perspective. $12 billion is more money than the NFL, NHL, Major League Baseball, and National Basketball Association make in a year. It's more profitable than all four of those sporting industries. So when somebody says to you that the American pastime is baseball, they're wrong. It's not. It's porn. The porn industry produces 200 porn films per week. That's one, more than one per hour. 12% of all the websites on the internet are porn sites. 25% of all searches on the internet are uh, for porn. And that includes on mobile devices. Bear in mind, 75% of kids have access, access to a mobile device. 43% of people on the internet are viewing porn. That's 28,000 porn viewers per second. 63% of men and 36% of women admit to accessing porn while at work. By 18 years old, 97%, 97% of boys and 80% of girls say that they viewed porn, many of them inadvertently the first time around, meaning something popped up or somebody showed them something and they, they unfortunately uh, saw pornography. The average age for, seeing, for having your first experience with porn is 11 years old and the number one consumer of pornography in America is boys between the ages of 12 and 17 years old. And as porn use rises, so does sexting. Sexting is sharing sexual images through text messaging. And a USA Today study said that there is, a, there is a significant expectation in our generation today where boys expect their girlfriends to send them nude pictures. It's, it's not like a maybe, it's an expectation. In fact, 60% of young people have been solicited uh, for sexual images online and 38% of them sent those images. 54% of young people uh, by the time they reach 18, admitted to having sexted in the past. 
Between 6 and 8% of adults uh, are addicted to pornography. That's between 18 and 24 million people in America. 70% of men between the ages of 18 and 34 have visit, visited porn monthly. Couples who watch porn uh, have a 200% higher divorce rate than couples who do not. 55% of sex offenders and 71% of child molesters admit that they were porn addicts. And what does that mean? How does that impact us? The vast majority of women right now who are in the sex industry were molested as girls. And I, as I read over those statistics, what I, what I want you and I to take away is simply this. How is this working for us? How are we doing? And I would posit that we are not doing well. In fact, we are steering our ship straight for the rocks and we're experiencing shipwreck all across our nation and all across our generation. And the reason for the shipwreck is not sexual desire. I am not suggesting that that in and of itself is bad. Actually, there's something much deeper. It is that our desires can never be fulfilled. Your, your desires and my desires can never be fulfilled in sex in a relationship, in romance. They also can't be fulfilled in that addiction or that job or that education pursuit. Nor will they ever be fulfilled in getting that next purchase or that next makeover or that next outfit. There is nothing in our desires that can fulfill us. Why? Because what drives us is sin. Sin is driving our desires and sin destroys. Sin is our instinctive urge or desire to go against God and pursue what we want. To make our wants our worship. And when we turn against God, we cut ourselves off from relationship with God. Sin corrupts our mind. It corrupts our emotions. It corrupts our desires. And it ruins us and ruins those around us. And it's deteriorating our nation. But the worst part of sin is that when it cuts us off from relationship with God, it leaves us on a trajectory toward eternal judgment. That's right. Our sin desire ruins us forever. But God refusing to leave you and I individually and refusing to leave our nation and our generation on a crash course trajectory with the siren mermaid song of eternal judgment intervened in your story and my story by becoming one of us and singing a sweeter song. So let me go back to the story of Homer and the Odyssey of the siren mermaids because not too far behind Captain Ulysses' ship, there was another great ship, captained by Orpheus. And when, the, when they also realized the dangers of the sirens and their rocks, one of the first, the first mate shouted out, Captain Orpheus! But his shout was different because his shout was one of celebration. The sweet song of the sirens lies just ahead, he said. And with the announcement, the crew cheered and the great Orpheus smiled. All around the ship, crewmen's voices rang with excitement that part of the voyage that they had longed for was soon at hand. In fact, there were some on the ship who had come along just to hear the music. With a knowing smile, the dauntless captain received a beautifully adorned case from his cabin boy. The acclaimed Orpheus carefully removed the priceless instrument as the crewmen stood nearby with bated breath. Then the princely grace, he lifted the instrument above his head in a gesture of victory while the crew around him whistled with enthusiasm, play it, play it, captain. Come on, great Orpheus, play it. And they cheered and they shouted. All eyes were transfixed upon their hero. Captain Orpheus took his stance and began to masterfully play the most perfect music of the men's ears had ever heard. Each crewman became lost in the reverie of the song. All too soon, the siren coastline was out of sight, and the master musician concluded the song that he himself had composed. Not a single man aboard the ship was tempted by the siren's melody. In fact, no one even noticed it. Though the mermaid's music was alluring and sweet, the superb Orpheus played for his crew a sweeter song. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ came to earth to die on a cross 
to take the collective eternal judgment that you and I deserve on himself so that when he died, he died once for all. He allowed his life to be driven against the rocks of sin to absorb our judgment, our shame, our guilt. But he not only died, he rose again. And in his victory, he conquered the power of sin. He defeated the strength of death and set us free from eternal judgment so that anyone who believes in Jesus by faith is forgiven of their sins, given new life, shame and guilt removed. And when we believe in Jesus by faith, God's invisible eternal spirit comes and enters in to our eternal spirit and we become filled forgiven and fulfilled and satisfied in Jesus Christ, which means we experience love from God that is the sweeter song, love that transforms our desires, love that transforms relationships, love that transforms our approach to sex so that now we can experience the love of Jesus which transforms us Then we express that with a sweeter song transformed by Jesus Christ, the love that we receive from God. Now, how do you apply that to your life and mine? How do we live this out in our everyday life as we look at purity being the sweeter song of sex? Let me just read a passage to you. Songs chapter eight, verse three and four. She, the bride, is singing this. And it is regarding sexual intimacy, but then she makes a critical point. His left arm is under my head and his right arm embraces me. And then she turns, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. And the principle is this. If we're gonna enjoy the purity of the sweeter song of sex, then then this is essential. We must guard our purity before marriage. Sexual intimacy has its ecstasy when used the right way in the right timing. But it has its pain when abused the wrong way and in the wrong timing. And our challenge is that we throw caution to the wind We pursue the siren mermaid song and we find ourselves shipwrecked. And I want you to know, as you're hearing this, if you're feeling a little bit guilty right now, this message is not about your past. It's not about stirring guilt in you. I want you to know that Jesus forgives, Jesus heals, Jesus transforms. He's giving you new life. But I also want you to know that he wants to give you a future. He wants to forgive your your past, draw a line in the sand, separating your past from your future, and then give you a new future where you can walk Walk in purity. Even if your past has been corrupted by sin, you can walk into the purity of future. And as you walk into the future in purity, you need to guard your sexuality before marriage. What what does that mean? What, What that specifically means is you must set healthy biblical boundaries around your personal sexuality and establish godly standards in your relationships. One of the most essential boundaries you and I must establish is that we must not become experts of human anatomy. What I mean by that is we live in a culture of human anatomy experts. A diamond expert is someone who looks at a lot of diamonds and becomes trained to see only the flaws. If you spend your time looking at a lot of human anatomy, you will only begin to see the flaws and you shift from enjoying what God intended to evaluating. Instead of it being pleasure, it becomes pain, which means you and I must guard ourselves against viewing porn, against engaging in pornographic conversations, against reading sexual Uh, books about sexual fantasy, seeing movies, listening to music that all arouses unhealthy desires, which is why we have to guard ourselves against unhealthy sexual desires and self-stimulation. It's not appropriate and it's not healthy because it stirs ahead of its time ungodly sexual desires that should only be fulfilled 
within the God-given confines and covenant of a marriage relationship. Additionally, um, you, you and I should put boundaries around our sexuality, guarding our sexuality before marriage, saying, expecting others to respect our sexuality. If you're in a dating relationship, the, the other person must and should respect your sexuality, which means they should not touch you in ways that inappropriately stir sexual desire. They must respect your body and not touch you in places in ways that sh they should not touch you. They must respect you. Uh, additionally, I want to challenge you just est to establish standards within your relationship. Let me just give you a quick uh, metaphor. If you're a parent and you, you have a yard and then uh, beyond the yard, you have a sidewalk, then another little strip of land, and then there's a big busy street. Where do you tell your kids not to go? Do you say, just don't play in the busy street? No. You tell them, don't go past our yard. Meaning, if they set foot on the sidewalk, they're punished. You and I, similar, why? Because you're trying to protect them from ultimate destruction by setting boundaries several, several steps back. Similarly, if you want to guard your sexuality, set standards much further back than just sexual intercourse. That way you protect and guard your heart and your purity. In a letter to the church in Corinth, the apostle Paul wrote, uh, about our purity, challenging a church that lived in the city of Corinth, a city of great sexual perversion, a city of sexual exploitation and manipulation of abuse and misuse. And he wrote this in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Let me be very clear. Your sexuality is not yours. It is a gift given to you from God and to be used to honor God. Therefore, before marriage, you, you and I have to understand our spouse is the only appropriate outlet for sexual fulfillment that God has given us. If you do not have a spouse in marriage, then you do not have an outlet for your sexual desire. Therefore, do not, un, do not arouse and stir sexual desire and then be stuck with no appropriate outlet you and I, I'm not talking about tying yourself to a mast. I'm talking about throwing yourself into the love of God, finding your satisfaction and fulfillment in relationship with God and in appropriate other relationships, godly friendships, godly dating that is not arousing sexual desire in an unhealthy way. Now let me shift over and let's talk to our couples. Because the challenge for couples is to guard your purity in marriage. What does it look like to guard your purity in marriage? Well, here's what I have discovered that um, there is a lot of confusion and misunderstanding within the church and within Christian couples about their sexuality. Some living in a pleasureless, unfulfilled marriage. Others carrying unnecessary guilt and shame about their sexual desire. And, and the principle that we can extract from uh, Song of Songs is simply this. God wants to provide instruction into your marriage and your sexuality. And it is both appropriate and necessary. God wants to guide you. Why? Because where else are you going to go? Where else should a Christian couple go to get instruction about their sexual intimacy? Should you look to movies? What, 50 Shades? You're going to learn from Hollywood or from the media and you're going to learn from love songs? Uh, you know, I'm free and you don't, you don't own me and you, you can't tell me what to do? I mean, the problem is that if you're getting instruction from anything else, it's going to ruin you. In fact, let me give you a key thought. Do, we must not and we cannot gain instruction about our sexual expression from the world around us. We must learn from God and God's word how to pray appropriately express our sexuality. Here's why. Because everything in the world around you is going to tell you that you're missing out, that you are not experiencing the best. And then it, it's a lie. It's a lie to make you dissatisfied so that you will buy what they're selling. That's right. It's a commercial. 
Everything you're seeing is a commercial from the enemy of your soul to get you to buy the sinful urges, sinful products in the world around you to destroy you. But God has a better way. And so let me just, let me read this to you and provide for you quickly a, a instruction on a better way to express the purity of your sexual intimacy. In the, song, in the songs, chapter 4, verse 16, she is singing and says, let my lover come into his garden and taste its choice fruits. The principle here is that you and I can and must share sex freely within our marriage. How? It's this. I want you to understand that Sex is a gift from God for your mutual pleasure and for you to share together. That means each of you as a spouse, you are neither a servant nor are you a spectator. You must respect each other's dignity and honor, but you must not uh, be, you know, benign or just give in. You should be fully engaged in, this, in your sexual experience. So, so let me offer some thoughts about that. Make yourself available. Don't, don't ignore the desires of your spouse. Be fully available. I realize that you go through seasons in marriage and life when you can't be as available as you would like, but offer yourself available as much as possible. In fact, just to give you an idea of maybe you're thinking, how much should I make myself available? Well, at least God provided one day a week for you to Sabbath, for you to rest, to sleep in, for you to be part of the church and to grow spiritually, to be the best version of yourself. I mean, what better day of the week than for you to also make yourself available to your spouse? So at least once a week on the Sabbath, God created space for you to have extra time together. Just saying, maybe that's a thought for you to consider. Another critical part as you read the song is that this couple is, they're, they're communicating creatively. Here it is. Communication and creativity create the space for sexual pleasure and intimacy. Men, you must touch your wife's heart and mind before you touch her body. She refers to herself as a garden. Too many men are just tearing up the garden to get out of it what they want instead of cultivating the garden by planting the seeds of romance and arousing their wife with words of adoration. That's right. Speak kind. Be caring. Romance her throughout the day. And as you do that, you are planting the seeds of arousal. The songs makes it clear that pleasure and passion are present in your wife, but you have to cultivate them. Wives, study your spouse. Learn how to please him. Together as a couple, embrace the process. The goal is not climax. The goal is intimacy. The climax is a momentary pleasure that God created as a gift, but the goal is oneness. That Throughout scripture, you constantly hear words regarding sex. Uh, the words that the Bible will use is to know and to become one, meaning there is a transcendent level or a transcendent experience within sexuality where a couple comes together and becomes one. That is more than sex. It's about relationship. It's about coming together in spirit, in mind, in body, in soul. And God designed you to embrace the journey, embrace the process, to be creative. You know, don't get stuck in a dual routine. He talks about it like a, a garden full of spice and aroma. The best way to spice up your marriage is a little bit of variety in your bedroom. And so maybe Study how to pleasure your spouse, and there's nothing wrong with that. That is for your enjoyment. Let me conclude with you couples this way. God designed you to enjoy the gift of purity within your marriage. Guard your marriage from outside influences that would create shame and guilt within your marriage, but fully enjoy and embrace your sexual, sexual intimacy. Now for each one of you, I want you to pause. And I want you to just take a moment and allow God to speak to your heart right now. I shared about how our culture sings the song of sex and 
It's like a siren mermaid song inviting you to shipwreck your life against the rocks of destruction. And maybe you find yourself there right now and and your moment is simply to say, God, forgive me. God, cleanse my life. I need your purity to wash away my impurities. I need your spirit to cleanse away my sin. And that's your moment to pause and pray. Others of you, you need to get back to guarding your purity. Some of you right now, you need to guard your purity in your marriage and reestablish some health in your home. Finally, there's, a few, there's some of you right now, you need to pray and say, Jesus, I need to receive your love in my life. So would you take a moment right now and pause and pray and let God speak to you. We hope that you enjoyed today's experience and that this message encourages you and inspires you this week. If you made a decision to follow Christ today, then congratulations, welcome to the family, and welcome home. We believe one of the most important first steps is to contact us to let us know about this decision that you've made. If you'd like, you could click on the prayer tab and get in contact with one of our volunteers. Also, if this message has inspired you and encouraged you and you would like to come alongside LifeHouse and support the ministry that we're currently doing, please click on the gift tab. Once again, thank you so much for joining us this week and being a part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.